Hi, I'm Dave Elliott. We are live on the WLOX Facebook page, and uh, we're happy that you're with us this afternoon, as you may know, over the last week, and we will continue throughout the rest of this week to take a look at an opioid problem in America, opioid abuse, not just in America, but right here in South Mississippi. Uh, the president has declared it a national emergency. Governor Phil Bryant has initiated a task force looking at opioids that does include heroin, which is a big problem, and uh, we've been finding out all sorts of things. While we're live here on Facebook, we'll have some statistics for you, some numbers that underscore how public health officials have labeled this an epidemic. I want to introduce the guests that we have here in the studio uh, with us today who will answer questions, and also when you ask questions, they'll be here and available. First, we have Dr. Randy Roth, Chief Medical Officer for Singing River Health System. Uh, he's with us today, uh, primarily looking at the emergency room and what happens over at Singing River Hospital, Dr. Roth. Fair enough. And we also have Patricia Gordon, a, a licensed addictions counselor and uh, works with uh, Singing River Health System Behavioral Health Services. Thanks to both of you for being here with us today. Dr. Roth, I want to start with you. Uh, you know, a lot of folks have questioned whether or not this truly is an epidemic or a crisis. From what you've seen in the Singing River Health System, what, how would you characterize it? I agree. It is a epidemic. We've seen it increase over the last five to ten years. Uh, we see it in our ER with either unintentional or intentional drug overdoses. We see it when patients who come in for pneumonia and they list their home medications and they've been on chronic narcotics for six, eight, nine, ten years, not realizing that this has led to an addiction. Maybe it was a previous surgery or maybe they get them off the streets in an illegal way. Um, our emergency department at least four or five, six times a week, we will go down as hospitalists and admit a patient with a drug overdose. Um, and of course, when you see them and they're obtunded, you treat them for everything and then you do their drug screen and they come back with opiates and you look at their home med list and it doesn't list any, any home meds that they're taking. So you know, when I've been talking to some of the experts and, and the question I always ask is how did we get to this point? And the finger is pointed at the pharmaceutical industry at doctors who are sometimes guilty of overprescribing, insurance companies sometimes who may not be monitoring what happens. And generally this begins with treatment for pain, doesn't it? Right. And so then it just gets out of hand, out of control. You know, this is, has so many heads to it. One head is eight or nine years ago, one of the questions that was asked for our value-based purchasing was, was your pain adequately taken care of when you were in the hospital? So we were actually incentivized to put pain down as a vital sign. Number two, um, there's a dramatic statistic right now that says a patient who's prescribed four weeks post-discharge, post-surgical opioids for pain, if they have a 50% chance of still being on that six to eight months after that surgery when they really don't have a need acutely for it. Yes, they have, you can blame pharma companies. Clearly they have very deep pockets and they reach out and they try to sell their product to the, to the physicians. It's also a problem on the street. If you have a patient who you prescribe for chronic pain syndrome or sickle cell anemia, a lot of those medicines end up being sold on the street. Um, there is a national pharmacy checklist called the PMP that we can follow now. It can be a little cumbersome, but it clearly, clearly in my experience, it, it is getting worse. I support the governor's effort to reel it in and our state medical licensing is making some changes now that's gonna make uh, a little more time consuming on the physician to make sure you're prescribing the right medicine in the right time for these so people. So at least everybody's being proactive on this and you talk about the governor. Uh, he, there's a $3.5 million grant that has been given to the state of Mississippi and the governor has the opioid and heroin kind of task force that is working on this. And of that $3.5 million, I think 80% is actually, Patricia, going towards treatment. And I think that's a, a good idea too because when those resources are made available, what are you seeing in terms of addiction, specifically with opioids or heroin or mm -hmm. even fentanyl, which we're gonna talk about a little bit, which is right. a synthetic opiate. What are you seeing on the well, ground? Well, what, uh, some of the statistics are telling us that, uh, of course, the heroin use has increased in the state of Mississippi and that there has actually been more use in the northern and southern parts of the state. Uh, some of the ways that uh, individuals do become addicted, other than if they're originally prescribed for uh, pain management, 
or that these medications are used by other family members when the medications are already in the home. For instance, young kids ages 12 to 13 now are rummaging through medicine cabinets for experimentation and a lot of those are opiates and if they are already predisposed perhaps to addiction because of their genetic makeup or maybe they are in a in a in an environment where they have friends that are using and experimenting they can easily become addicted as well. Well, that's what I wanted to talk to you about. There are common denominators. There are people who just through, as you said, their nature are predisposed to uh, addiction. I mean, it could be alcohol. It could be right. It could be gambling. An addiction yes. to gambling. People just yes. seem to have that uh, tendency in their uh, in their makeup. But are, are you, is there a common denominator that you're seeing with, for instance, of alcoholism and the use of these painkillers or heroin? Well, what, what is happening is, uh, of course, is since, it, since we do get it through, or they do get access to opiates and alcohol through different uh, measures, uh, it pretty much is um, uh, as a result of their environment their genetic makeup and and other factors like that. Those are pretty much addiction is the same, whether it's alcohol, it's opiates, like you said, gambling, anything like that is um, predisposed. What we know about uh, narcotics especially is that mostly primarily men, ages 24 to about 54, are the ones that are uh, at higher risk and are at higher risk for overdose. Okay, well just some of the numbers that we're going to talk to you about, and this comes from the National Institute on Drug Abuse. Every day more than 90 Americans die after overdosing on opioids, so that is a staggering and very alarming statistic right there. Roughly 21 to 29 percent of patients prescribed opioids for chronic pain end up misusing them and that's the cycle isn't it dr roth when you Correct. get this prescription it seems like suddenly you need more 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 and then sometimes you graduate to stronger drugs as a result of that no doubt you can start off taking a percocet after having your gallbladder removed on a monday and run out of those and need something stronger and stronger and stronger um, i also want to make the connection between mental health and addiction. Mm -hmm. Clearly there is a big combination with, between patients who may be bipolar or depression and their likelihood to have an addiction issue also. Um, addiction is a disease, there's no doubt about that. But a lot of times you have to dig a little bit deeper into a patient mm -hmm. who may be addicted, alcohol, heroin, opiates, benzodiazepines, and you find an underlying mental health, whether it's bad depression that's led to use whether it's bipolar disease, if they take these to slow themselves down or to speed themselves up. And uh, a lot of times when you get to that route and they get in great hands of some of our psychiatrists, we can fix their addiction by addressing their underlying mental condition. Mm. And Patricia, uh, it would be nice if we could find uh, more organic means of treating people for pain. And uh, I don't know really what's out there. Some people have talked about medical marijuana. Some people mm -hmm. have even said things as simple as meditation or uh, mm -hmm. something that's more natural. Uh, do, you, do you encourage <laughs> patients who are dealing with this kind of pain to maybe look for alternative treatment rather than just here's the, the latest pill that's going to solve your problem? Well, when we, when we treat uh, addiction, we treat the whole person. In other words, we, um, we look at their mental health issues. We look at what's going on with them physiologically, biologically, and spiritually. So all of that in, is encompassed in their treatment. Uh, like Dr. Roth mentioned, the folks that are at higher risk for dependence are the ones that do have mental health problems because they're often self-medicating for those issues, for anxiety, for depression. So once, once they do see uh, a psychiatrist that can prescribe appropriately to treat that disorder, then we can work better with uh, the addiction itself. And both of those do have to be treated together, the mental health issue 
and the addiction issues should be treated together. And those are folks that we do identify as having a dual diagnosis. Well, uh, I have a story running tonight on the uh, 10 o'clock news where we talk to law enforcement. And this thing is being addressed on every, every level, the federal government through the Drug Enforcement Administration is working on this. The Mississippi Bureau of Narcotics is right on the front lines here in the state of Mississippi. And I also talked to uh, Gulfport Police Chief uh, Leonard Papania, where they're seeing an uptick. On heroin has made a big comeback on the streets. And I'm, I'm just wondering how that, that uh, leap is made from sure. oxycodone or oxycontin or whatever, Percocet, uh, Loratab, whatever it might uh, happen to be in the case of prescription pills, to suddenly resorting to looking on the streets for heroin. Desperation and financial. Um, obviously, I have no personal experience with heroin, but if you read the statistics, it's a much cheaper drug to mm -hmm. access. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you're hooked on an opiate and you're taking two Loratab 10s every six hour for your addiction, and the source of your lore tabs run out, your only access at that point may mm -hmm. be heroin and it's much cheaper. Um, and unfortunately that exposes people to a lot more bad things that can happen when you start using injectables to supplant or take the place of a PO narcotic. Um, it's a lot cheaper and it's coming back, there's no doubt. All righty, well we are uh, live on Facebook. I'm gonna talk to my, our producer, Todd Durbin, right now since we're Live on Facebook, I'm just going to tell you, Todd, I'm not, I'm not seeing the uh, comments on my uh, iPad here. So if there's anything I need to do, because we really want folks to be engaged, if you have any, any questions or comments, and so we'll be able to uh, scroll through those. It's about opioid abuse in South Mississippi. Uh, it's become a critical situation that uh, everybody is addressing. And uh, Patricia, I also had an opportunity to go over to the home of grace and speak with two young women who had two completely different stories. One was kind of a girl who, th uh, a young woman, mm -hmm. who through partying kind of got into it. And the other one was the pain medication right. who had medical right. conditions. But they both had a similar story in terms of it spiraling out of control. And one thing I find interesting with certain drugs historically, it kind of, you'll find it in a particular and specific socioeconomic community, but this one seems to be crossing all of those lines. It can happen to anyone. Addiction can happen to anyone. And what does happen when you talk about uh, it spiraling out of control is when they, when they do get into using, it, they can develop what we call a tolerance so that they are always looking for more and more drugs to get the same high. In other words, it just, like you said, spirals out of control. Well, we have a uh, 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 Laney, I guess that is. Hope it's not Lanny. Thanks for uh, uh, participating with us on Facebook. Uh, she writes, people that abuse the drug are making people that need them suffer. And that is almost an unintended consequence because there may be, Dr. Roth, legitimate reasons for this kind of pain medication, but as a result of the abuse, the overdoses, the death, and all of the steps that are be taken, being taken now to control prescriptions and everything, there are people who truly are in need of some of these sure. medications. Sure, there are certain patient populations, chronic back pain that may be not surgical, cancer, end of life pain, cancer pain, those patients need these medicines to have a comfortable exit strategy at the end of life. A lot of cancer patients will have pain that only responds to opioids, as opposed to some mechanical pain that will respond, you spoke earlier, to things like physical therapy, even acupuncture, maybe chiropractic medicine. Um, I'm all about whatever works for the patient. But clearly, when the pharmacy starts saying, we're not gonna fill anything more than a seven-day run of an opioid because of the risk of abuse, that puts patients who really need these for longer than seven days, it, it's gonna be an inconvenience and it's gonna take us a while to work through that. All righty, well, oh, we're getting a lot of comments here now that I'm scrolling. Uh, what about uh, a woman writes, Nancy, uh, Kratom It's being used for pain overseas. Either one of you heard about this? K-R-A-T-O-M, a particular medication. Mm -hmm. well, I have no experience with that. 
Okay, well, sorry about that, Nancy. Uh, unable to answer your question on that. Most bipolar people go without being uh, diagnosed, and then they try to self-medicate. Does that mean anything to either one of you? Clearly. So you have mm -hmm. a bipolar person who, in their manic phase, can't sleep, and they go to their grandmother's, you mentioned it mm -hmm. earlier, to right. their grandmother's um, bathroom and they see uh, Xanax or they see Lortab or they see Oxycontin and they take that in an attempt to slow down, to slow their cycle down and to mm -hmm. rev down to get some sleep. And that can begin a very precipitous decline into addiction without knowing the real reason they're having the craving to take it is self-medicating. Alcohol is a great example. Everybody thinks alcohol is an excitable, it's not, it is actually a depressant. So you, know, you may have one drink and feel a little bit of a lift, but by drink four, you're usually depressed. And there are a lot of people who self-medicate anxiety with alcohol. Now I have somebody, uh, Christina writes, it's not a recreational pastime, it's needed. And then she goes on to add, big pharma is responsible, period. It's easy to pick on big pharma because there are so many political issues involving big pharma in this country. Uh, when it comes to health care in general and the costs. But, Dr. Rod, I don't know how, how far you want to go on big, big pharma and uh, on the, uh, medi the prescriptions and all of this I will tell you stuff. that pharma, pharmaceutical companies are, are partly to blame. There's no doubt about it. They, they were in control of a lot of the studies. Um, some companies do it better than others. Uh, some people have a much easier sale tactic than other people other companies, but clearly, I think pharma has to step up the table and they have yeah, to recognize. All you have to do is watch TV. Look at all the commercials on TV right. for all the new drug medications and, and drugs they're, uh, mm -hmm. they're coming out with. Uh, here, I want to get to some more comments uh, from uh, some of the people uh, uh, who, again, a lot of people seem to think that because we're labeling it a crisis and epidemic that we are somehow overlooking the people who truly are in need. And, and I find that, uh, that rather uh, interesting. Uh, people getting addicted to things. Uh, not all mental health patients are addicted to pain meds. That goes without That's saying, right? Clear. Right, clear. And, not, and not everyone who is prescribed an opiate is going to become addicted either. Uh, it's not a recreational pastime. It's needed. We had that one already. And then a lot of people feel this way. I think about any kind of addiction where they just come right out and say, they, meaning the people who are addicted, choose to take it. Uh, it didn't choose that person. You have to fight that kind of all the time where some people who are on the outside looking in right. will almost blame the right. person. And, and, I do, and I do believe that that is um, a little bit of misunderstanding about the disease of addiction because they do get to a point where, where and maybe initially they did make a choice, but, it's, but the whole idea of addiction is something that does happen. It can happen be, be, because of their genetic makeup. It can happen because of the way their body processes medications and drugs. And it, it can just happen. That's why we say it can happen to anyone. And, and really what's most important is what we do to help that person when it gets to that point. And, and that's Dr. what Roth, everyone needs to be involved with. Are, is the medical profession, are, are the doctors being trained properly now? Is there a, a concerted effort to be ahead sure. of this problem in terms of recognizing it, what's it's out there great, and what needs to be done? Great point. Just in the state of Mississippi recently, they have mandated that part of our continuing medical education is just linked to alcohol or drug abuse, benzodiazepine abuse. Clearly, that helps. Number two is, what can we do to get our patients to recognize that addiction is a disease? And mm -hmm. I tell my patients every day, mm -hmm. if I told you you had diabetes and I prescribed insulin, would you take it? Dr. Roth, I do it every day. I'm telling you, you're addicted to this substance. I can refer you to somebody who can help you. Well, addiction is, is it really a disease. I'm telling you, it is a disease. And once you get past that stigma of addiction, I think patients can understand it. If I told you you had high blood pressure and I wrote you a medicine for it, you'd probably take it. Um, so once you get past the stigma of addiction or mental health, mental health is just as big of a deal to me as an internist as diabetes is. And we have very competent people that can treat it. 
get past the stigma, accept the fact that addiction is a disease, and let us get you in to some people who can help you. Okay, uh, we have April who writes, by the way, we're live on Facebook, we're discussing this opioid crisis, WLOX has committed all of this week to uh, uh, examine uh, from a law enforcement angle, uh, we've been talking to some people who are addicted, uh, we've, uh, Doug Walker did a story on Narcan, Dr. Rob, I don't know if you're familiar oh, yeah. with Narcan, Narcan, which is now being made available to first responders. Mm. Uh, the, the guys, men and women who are EMS, right? I think they, it's a life-saving training method. Mm -hmm. Narcan is a reversal agent for opioids. Mm -hmm. So a if a first responder shows up at a patient's home who's found down, and the first thing they see is two pill bottles, their ability to administer Narcan and get that person's respiratory rate up could be life-saving, and I think it's a great um, initiative that they've started. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's another thing we talk about these unintended consequences is there's a movement now to start regulating what's being prescribed. Uh, then it, if these people are addicted, Patricia, and we kind of talked about this already, they may not have an alternative if they haven't beaten this addiction yet then to turn to your average street drug dealer well, as they search for uh, that, that fix, if you will. Mm -hmm. Actually, there are treatments, and uh, one of the things that uh, is important is that if folks who are seeking treatment, if they come to the right professionals, we can steer them in the right direction to maybe even encourage them to look for a physician that may prescribe something like Suboxone which is um, a, a medical treatment along with therapy and counseling. Uh, we can encourage them with uh, medical stabilization if needed. We can encourage them with uh, intensive outpatient treatment. There's different levels of treatment, intensive outpatient, outpatient or inpatient. All of those um, can help them in addition to treating any mental health disorder that they may have. Okay, uh, we have April who writes, Patricia, you may have a comment on this. A lot of people are giving pain medicine to make sure they are happy, <laughs> she writes. So that's not necessarily a need because of pain, but it's people just for the high. Right, and that is a reason why some folks do get addicted or become addicted is because they And are, it also addresses the depression angle, doesn't right, it? Right, right, and they find that, and this has happened to everyone, uh, because like I said, everyone reacts differently to opiates, but the, there are some that get a sense of euphoria, a high, and those are the ones that continue with that, um, drug use. Uh, D writes, it's the uh, withdrawal that most people suffer with is trying to stop using opioids. I wonder how, mm -hmm. uh, how that is on a person physically, Dr. Uh, Rob, the withdrawal. It I mean, is I'll horrible. admit, I, I've never admitted this, I don't think, before. I, I, I'm a cigarette smoker and I can't imagine. I've tried to quit before. <laughs> if you could ever help me with that, I'll, I'll talk give to you, you a after. call. <laughs> okay, after the show, we can talk about that. But they're just dealing with the withdrawal from, from opioids must be just uh, oh, such a weight on people. Well, let me make something clear. Opiate withdrawal can be miserable. It's usually not life-threatening, but benzodiazepine and alcohol, alcohol withdrawal can be life-threatening. You hear about the famous delirium tremens or DTs and the pink elephants and the squirrels in the room. Are they real? Is that real? Uh, it's real. <laughs> they're seeing it. They're thinking it's real. Um, but opioid withdrawal can be horribly, horribly uncomfortable for the patient, um, heavy sweating, tremors, it's miserable. So we actually offer it at Singing River, but a lot of places do a mm -hmm. detoxification slash wellness program for a couple of days where we can transition them off of opiates, taper down their withdrawal symptoms over four to five days and hopefully hand them off to an outpatient center that will do long-term intensive either inpatient mm -hmm. or outpatient training. Mm -hmm. I encourage people to speak to their healthcare provider, their doctor, their nurse practitioner, whoever they have, to steer them there because for me to encourage someone to stop on their own, some people can do it. So I've heard people smoke 40 years and whatever happens on that Tuesday, they quit. 
they are very mentally strong people if they can do that on their own. Yeah, well, Don't be afraid to ask for help if you want to get off these, these things. Uh, this is something else, and, and I had a guy, I interviewed a guy, this, he, this is a fascinating story, this guy's named Charlie Roberts, and I will have him on a TV story also tonight, by the way, at 10 o'clock. He was addicted to heroin, finally beat it. Now he is a volunteer at drug court in Harrison County. Mm -hmm. He is getting his master's at USM to become a social worker. And so he told me that he, it, life's kind of gone full circle for him, having now seen this from both sides. But I want to ask you, either one of you, Dr. Roth or Patricia, maybe you, Patricia, on this, because I had somebody tell me uh, this before, too. Uh, Christina writes, uh, we don't have any opioid kind of clinics, and a lot of people can't afford treatment for addiction. What is, if you go to one of these private places, it can be as much as ten thousand right. <clears throat> dollars or something, can it? So what's available? It can. Okay, so for let people? me let me say that uh, there are websites that you can access. Number one, in the state of Mississippi, there's a Mississippi uh, State Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse that will give a listing of all of their state-run, state-funded. Uh, outpatient facilities and inpatient facilities in, in across all the regions of the state of Mississippi that you can access. And at the very least, they do, most of them have sliding fee scales, uh, but they will work with you. The other is a website called SAMHSA, that's the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration that also has a national listing of state-funded um, treatments that are available. Lorraine Sanders says that there's just not enough help uh, in this state, but we've already established that there is. And there's going to be more coming now that the president, I think, declared right. a national right. emergency is even how he put it. But we do have this $3.5 million right. coming to the state. But there appears to be, Dr. Roth, I don't know what you've read or what you've heard, that a greater commitment is probably coming down the pike, uh, eventually a financial commitment from the federal government. I think the federal government is going to put more funds allocated toward mental health and addiction. Uh, the big push would be for the insurance companies to recognize and reimburse mm -hmm. mental health and addiction. Uh, you mentioned earlier, uh, even patients who are well insured, they work 25 yards at Ingalls or 10 years at the Beau Rivage, their preferred health care plan may carve out only $2,000 a year of annual benefits for addiction or mental health. But if you have a bypass surgery, they'll pay $45,000 for it. You know, my ask of the, of the carriers is to treat mental health and addiction like you treat coronary artery disease. If somebody needs to go to 12 Oaks in, in Florida to get treatment, mm -hmm. they should pay for it like they pay for you to go to Oshner and have a kidney transplant. They're not there yet. Uh, my ask of them as you know, an internist is they, de they need to treat it the same. These are life altering diseases and it's no different if it's addiction or mental health or coronary artery bypass graft. They should all be treated the same. Unfortunately, they're not. Uh, Patricia, you know, folks who have never dealt with addiction either in their own lives or in the lives of somebody perhaps in their family, how destructive is it? Uh, one of my interviews is with a patient who was an RN, lost as a result of her addiction, her license, was fired by the hospital. Before she knew it, she was in jail, uh, living on the streets. What is kind of the residual effect on a, an, a, 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 an addict's family? Well, we do know uh, that the addict's family, what they end up doing is trying, what they end up doing initially is what we call negative enabling, which actually they're trying to help them, but they are actually continuing the addict's use because they continue to provide them comfort with housing, with money, with transportation. And at all. some point, they might just cut them off. Well, <laughs> and that's probably what they should do. But- uh, That's tough love, though, it, isn't ex it? You're exactly right. That's exactly right. That's one of the hardest things for family members to do. And I actually have family members that come see me to get some input about what can I do with my loved one that is in addiction. So the best thing that they can do is to not provide them with those comforts and instead tell them that they will not continue uh, to support them in their addiction, 
that they will instead be by their side to find them some help and then begin to explore uh, some resources. All righty. Well, all this week, uh, WLOX has made a commitment to take a look at this opioid crisis opioid abuse in South Mississippi. We've tried to cover it from uh, virtually uh, every angle. Uh, we've enjoyed, I suppose, being with you on uh, uh, Facebook Live, and we've received a lot of interaction and engagement from you, and I want to thank you for that. A lot of good questions and comments. We'll post this later, and you can kind of continue the conversation within the thread of this discussion on opioid abuse on WLOX. Uh, Facebook, uh, WLOX.com, where you can read all of our stories. And on all of our newscasts, you can see how WLOX is approaching this epidemic. I want to thank our guests for uh, being here uh, with us today. Dr. Roth uh, over from uh, Sigma River Health System, the Chief Medical Officer, and uh, Patricia Gordon, a licensed addictions counselor. Thanks to both of you for being with us today. Wonderful insight. Thank you. And, and we appreciate it. And thanks uh, to you for being with us on Facebook Live. And as I said, look for more on all of the WLOX News platforms, opioid abuse in South Mississippi.